Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Zach. I'm with SCU Bio. I'm excited to be here, and I'm, I'm excited to hear from our panel today focusing on leading virtual teams effectively. I don't know about everyone else, but it seems like we've all been in Zoom world for the past several months. This is a very timely subject. Um, leading our discussion today as moderator is Ginny Dunlop, a partner at Parker Poe. Uh, Ginny is a versatile, versatile litigator and advisor who focuses on getting her clients what they need so they can get back to business. She handles employment and business disputes in federal and state courts for clients, including the healthcare industry. She will be joined by Andrew Collins of Alchemy and Chartspan's Annie McCoy. So Ginny, I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Zach, and thanks everyone for joining today. I know that um, if you're like me, there was a fateful day back in March when your um, work life, if you've been someone who goes to the office um, Monday through Friday, like I do, your work life quickly changed and you had to pivot and adjust and likely uh, your organizations had to make some changes. Um, and so we're here today to talk about some of the um, ways that we can, as we continue to work remotely, um, we can lead effectively. I have a background in employment law, but today I really, and I've been counseling clients on um, legal issues that have come up um, during the pandemic, and, and many of those do focused around um, how to manage employees remotely. But today I'd like for us to hear from Annie and Andrew to talk about what their experiences have been with both of their companies in making this change. And so for today's purposes, we're going to focus on three key um, essential things that leaders need to do in order to lead effectively. And those are clarity, communication, and connection. So essentially the three C's of, of effective remote learning. And to give credit where credit is due, I got that catchphrase from um, an article I read in Forbes, and I'll credit that to Julie Wilson, who's the founder for the, of the Institute for Future Learning. So with that, we thought we would um, let Andrew go first and then Annie and um, have them tell us what the experience was for transitioning to remote for both of their companies and get some of their um, advice on the three C's. Andrew? Thank you, Jenny, and thank you, Zach. Uh, glad to be here today talking about this subject very near and dear to HR's heart for sure. Um, again, Andrew Collins, uh, Human Resources Manager for Alchemy. Um, we, can, we can go to the next slide, please. So a little context will help with my following slides on who is, what is Alchemy. Alchemy is a contract development, testing, manufacturing organization for pharma and biotech. So we make drugs and drug products for um, all different sizes of the pharmaceutical industry and it's full life cycle. We do everything from uh, development of the molecules all the way through manufacturing, production, testing, packaging, and distribution. Um, so I think that's helpful to understand because um, we have a fairly traditional um, on-site type of culture in alchemy or had a uh, fairly traditional on-site culture because the large majority of our employees really need to touch things to do those things that I just identified. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So this isn't a, a COVID presentation, but it's hard to separate the two because um, we probably would not be where we are right now in our new evolving culture if not for COVID. So recognizing where we were, um, we were traditional on site. We had clearly de defined shift schedules, very little flexibility for most of our roles, um, really relied heavily on that face-to-face -face communication because people were around um, HR and leadership wise, we were very risk averse and um, we felt, you know, as, as traditional companies do, to be fair and consistent to employees, you need to treat them all as similarly as possible and not have too many outliers. Um, our IT strategy was really centered around uh, company devices and security on our networks. And we had a telecommute policy that uh, it was present, but we didn't use it a whole lot. To be honest, it was in our handbook, but 
um, not really in our culture. Um, so if we could go to the, the next slide. I'm gonna go through these uh, fairly quickly because the, um, the value in this is really gonna be in the question and answer. So we wanna try to get to that as quickly as reasonable. Um, so where we are now, right? Post pandemic, many months later, uh, about 30% of our workforce, we found a way to be remote. Um, really important to recognize that uh, most of those folks would not have picked to be remote, um, but we did have to ask them to protect those uh, folks that do, do have to be on site. So we've gotten creative and we've gotten much more flexible with shift start and stop times, um, become much more risk tolerant, right? That's been a growth area for me in HR and our legal departments and um, lots of folks in these shared services to treat every single request as unique because you know we, we've had lots coming in recently with people going back to kids going back to school right you know those weren't there when this all started because all the schools were shut down so things are ever changing everybody's variables are different so you really need to look at those and, and try and find ways to say yes versus um, you know in the past you may not have had that perspective um, communication is definitely multimedia now, right? We're, we're on teams, we're deep into teams, uh, but that has brought different challenges that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, our HR strategy is one that is a combination of flexibility and accountability, uh, not, not necessarily being seen to be productive, right? You know, that, that's a, kind of an older way of looking at things. And our IT strategy has to mirror that as well, one of flexibility and security. Those things cannot live separately uh, if you're going to you know, keep all your proprietary information uh, secure, but also you know, allow people the flexibility that we need in today's world. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so now, where are we working, right? We're, we're, we're jumping in our time machine now and saying if we could have predicted that we could be as successful as we are now with as flexible as we are, what would we have done differently? Because it's not too late and this is not going away anytime soon. Um, so we're looking at cultural and team building efforts, specifically onboarding new employees. If you have a new employee that's gonna immediately go remote, um, how are they gonna get all of those things that you were doing before? Uh, we used to do a three-day orientation. Now we're down to one. Um, how, how are we filling that gap now? Uh, team building efforts, you know, we, uh, and this really blends in with the appreciation and blind spots really, really well. Um, we had very robust employee engagement teams before. They all were on hiatus while we were figuring all of this out, uh, building those back in. Um, appreciation blind spots, what, what that means is, you know, we, we've identified, we had some employees that uh, were getting spot awards all the time for doing really, really great things. Um, but we an analyzed that data and they weren't getting those spot awards in the last couple months. Um, that probably doesn't mean they're not good employees anymore. That just means we're not looking the same way or, or in a new way, right, for those opportunities because they're not right in front of you uh, and easy to do. So you've got to think a little bit different than you were before uh, and data can help you do that. And then training for employees and leadership. I'll give you one little example there. Uh, Microsoft Teams, right? When you introduce a new tool, uh, you don't always appreciate some of the challenges that it'll come with. Little example there is the red, green, yellow buttons. Um, it, when you're in a culture that is very on site and you go to a tool like that that has those status updates, it can be easy for a manager or leader to look and say, if it's yellow, they must not be productive. Um, the tool's not perfect and let's say they're at home with a kid for, you know, the whole day they're doing virtual learning. Um, you, you've got to understand that they may get inter interrupted every 15 minutes while they're at home or more frequently. So their eight hour day that they used to do in the workplace is now 12 hours, right? They're getting all that work done, but they're having to accommodate all those interruptions. Um, just reaching out, making that connection um, and communicating with your employees, understanding what their reality is, is, is very, very important uh, because they would potentially choose to be in the office and not doing a 12 hour uh, work day that's on off, on off, uh, but they're getting it done, right? With the best interest of their families and the company in mind as well. And then proactively planning and investing. Different example is you may have an employee that is either 
you know, kids are, are, are not in the picture yet, so they don't have that virtual learning interruption piece, or they're out of the house, and they may be thinking about continuing education, right? Because now they don't have a commute, so they've gained two hours in their day every day. They're super productive at work. It is your company's processes and policies and the way you look at investing in your employees aligned with that now? Can you uh, support them, you know, going back to school, uh, creating an education reimbursement policy, or just asking, you know, what are your goals and, and aspirations? So you can support them in a different way that they may not have had time for. So maybe working at home is a huge positive for them. And how can you capitalize on that and keep them engaged in your organization? Um, I know that was a lot really fast. This is a huge topic, um, but it, it's kind of neat how alchemy is on one end of the spectrum. And I'm now going to transition over to my colleague, Annie, with Chartspan that maybe was on the other end of the spectrum on a little bit more proactive on finding ways to find uh, opportunities for people to work from home. And it's interesting how we've had a lot of the similar challenges. Um, so Annie, I'll turn it over to you. Perfect, thank you, Andrew. Um, Y'all, my name is Annie McCoy. I serve as the Chief Growth Officer for Chartspan. Chartspan uh, is based in Greenville, South Carolina. I am not, however, I was already a virtual employee for Chartspan, and I'll, I'll sort of weave that into my story with you all. Um, I, the building that you see, let me just comment on this real quickly, for those of you that are in the Greenville or been in the Greenville area, um, that is no longer our space. We had a thousand square feet in a building on North Main, or on Main Street in Greenville that we vacated. And it was very sad for many of the folks that had been with our company for years to see that Chartspan logo come off that very present building on the corner of a block downtown as we retired that space. And that's part of our story. We are fully virtual right now and made a pivot very quickly. I think we were in some ways prepared. We learned a lot along the way and we certainly have works in progress that I'll call out quickly for you as well. So if I could switch to the next slide, please, that'd be great. Uh, very quickly, too many words on this page. I'm not going to read them all to you. It's a, a little bit overview of who we are. We are a medical um, technology and services company. We serve the healthcare industry. We partner with physician practices and we serve their Medicare patients. Our mission is to support the chronically ill Medicare patient uh, through programs that, I'll just go back a slide for me, that are supported by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also known as CMS. We, uh, um, our partners outsource their services in these particular programs to us, and we become their turnkey solution. The problem that we're solving is the rising risk of the chronically ill and taking advantage of programs that now reimburse providers to try to flatten that cost curve and keep our chronically ill patients from rising in risk and experiencing a decline in their condition. I won't go into the details of how we do all that, um, other than to say we have our own proprietary software that the company leaders have built. We house our own call center, so everything that we provide under this umbrella is homegrown and um, delivered directly from our own employees. We're proud to have delivered our one millionth patient encounter in a ver already virtual service just a few weeks back, and we're really proud of the trajectory that we're on. We could just move one more slide. So a little bit about who we were back in February and who we are now as a company. Um, we housed, as I mentioned earlier, as I described the architecture of where we were housed, a thousand square feet in a, um, a historic building in downtown Greenville, South Carolina. We had already had plans to distribute our workforce by being shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow in the call centers that we run. We were limited to, and confined by space, um, real estate, you know, of course, being part of our, um, our expense uh, line items. We were also limited regionally in that we could not extend out to a workforce beyond that area within South Carolina. So we had plans. We had plans to grow our distributed workforce. We had not yet done so though, um, but we had a technical roadmap to do so. We had an HR plan to create a gradual growth in our footprint by allowing new employees to be virtual. Well, come February, we uh, realized that we needed to potentially accelerate those plans 
Um, and we learned a lot from a test run that we did with just four employees. Um, not all of that pilot was a success. So we took those learnings and then literally fast tracked ourselves in March. I was already a remote employee in the growth uh, role. I oversee a sales force and a client success team who are already virtual. So my world was operating somewhat virtually, although I was in that Greenville office for up, up to eight days a month. I commuted back and forth, but everyone that I managed minus four people were in their own distributed workforce model, but our employees who deliver our services were not. So we literally on a single day, as many of you did as well, made the decision it was time. It was time to spread out. It was time to get people home. And we executed a plan to distribute all of our employees and just about 150 to 170 that work uh, in serving our patients and our providers that were previously three feet less or less away from each other in call centers and everyone was home within 10 days. We were very careful in how we executed and I think we, um, I can stand on the shoulders of my colleagues who um, made these plans happen and claim success. It meant moving our technical infrastructure to a, um, to a remote model. We have to work in a HIPAA protected environment. Uh, we are interacting with patients. There are uh, security and privacy rules that we have to honor. Um, my colleagues can tell you a little bit about that as well, but we um, quickly made sure that we had all the mechanisms we needed to protect patient information and to provide secure workplaces for our employees in their homes. It meant that our HR team had to quickly develop policies to manage a distributed workforce. That was a Herculean lift. And I'll tell you all the folks that lead these teams here that I have displayed across the page um, credit each other with, with success. I credit all of them with our success. We needed to move our call center leadership and the telephony equipment um, that was already in a virtual environment um, with our provider, but make sure we had the mechanisms in place to run a help desk for our employees, to create access to team leaders and supervisors and have our a call center mechanism that could support our staff as well as the work that we do. And then lastly, the people that lead our facilities. As I said, we cleared out of a large space very quickly and left the workspace behind us to sort of be disseminated, to close, to close that down, find new workspace for our technical equipment. And we're now uh, occupying a little bit less than um, 100 square feet um, of space until we land in our next location at a time to be determined. I think all of us here at one point thought this was a temporary relocation of our staff, right? And that we would all come back together. And as Andrew alluded, we are, we are not expecting to do that anytime soon. It sounds like you're not either at Alchemy We're gonna make a quick shift back. We are distributed and we are a remote work team and we are now um, embracing, embracing ourselves for the fact that we, not, we may not even be halfway through this transition. Let me just go one more slide in please. Thank you. So what were our mission critical priorities? I've waved at some of these already on the past slide. I'll just call out a few that are top of mind for all of us in our leadership position. We needed to put the mechanisms in place to manage and monitor employee performance. I think we, back to Jenny's conceptual framework at the beginning, we needed to have crystal clarity around what expectations we have for our employees and for each other and make sure that we had the tools in place to monitor performance and to manage performance. And I think our team leaders have done so very successfully. One thing I would call out, it builds on something Andrew said is balancing predictability with flexibility. Um, we also have employees at home with their homeschooling now and have young children or very ages of care, um, uh, family members that they're caring for. We expect a certain amount of performance across a work day, but that work day now is now flexible so that we honor our employees when they need to clock out and take time to virtually attend a, a child's school meeting or to manage a project with a family member and then come back online. So truly these are no longer eight hour days. They are 12 hour intervals where we get eight hours worth of work done spaced out across time. And we've provided our employees with that flexibility that they can come in and out of our work systems to create time to balance the other demands that they have. Our HR team would tell you that we've managed the short term. We have a lot to do long term. 
um, that, uh, again, uh, my colleagues have mentioned um, virtual onboarding, virtual hiring, virtual interviewing, as well as long-term employee engagement and long-term learning solutions to ensure that we're constantly developing our workforce. That's hard. We've implemented a learning management system. I don't yet think that we've capitalized on all that it offers, and I wouldn't say that many of us feel like we're expert at it yet, but we're learning. In terms of communication and connection, we find that culture is king. We had a very close, tight-knit community before we sent everyone home. It still matters that we focus on culture, but the culture has changed. But we've done things to make sure that we're connecting. We've implemented a social media uh, platform called Work Place that allows for employees to communicate, share stories, pictures, awards, uh, news and alerts and changes in policy as well. And we expect everyone to be in workplace. What we found interesting vignette that our, our hourly employees are much more connected to the social media platform, internal social media platform than our leadership team is. We excuse ourselves, but don't forgive ourselves because we are on camera all day. We are on camera in meeting after meeting, so maybe sometimes nine to 10 hours a day, we are facing a video camera just like I am right now, and don't feel the need to be contributing to social media, but it's oh so important that we are, and we have to challenge ourselves as leaders, this one included, to do a better job there. All of our meetings require that we are cameras on. Now, that doesn't mean from time to time someone um, asks for a pass. It's not a particularly great camera day and they'll, they'll ask not to be on camera, but the expectation is that when we are in conferences, we are, we are visually connected and we honor that um, every day. We also, um, as maybe as, as tagged to the HR solutions, we needed to recognize that working at home is not for everyone. Um, we did a survey of our employees as they were distributed. Overwhelmingly, 92% said that they were satisfied and if given the option would continue to work in this manner. There's a handful, small handful who cannot make it work for any number of reasons. We need to honor them. We need to create an open forum for communication and help them find other opportunities if this work setting is not gonna, um, not gonna be ideal for them. I've mentioned a few of our works in progress. We are not by any means complete, and it is a journey that we are embracing. And I think so far we've been successful, but lots more work to do. Let me see what's in my next slide, please. And then I'll wrap up quickly for you. Uh, one of the things I challenged um, Jenny and Andrew as we put our heads together for this session is that I think as leaders, we need to connect with each other around what's working, what's filling our, our tanks, where are we getting our fuel? And uh, a question that I ask folks when I meet them and connect across industries or across companies is, what are you reading? Um, is there anything on your nightstand that you would recommend? And so something on my nightstand that I'm I, actually virtual nightstand because I'm doing it through a, um, uh, an audio service is the book Stretch. It is um, a work by a gentleman named Scott Sun and Shine, I will recommend it highly for you. It helps us, his work helps us understand the, the um, what's in our individual DNA that makes us stretchy in times like this. And where do we find employees who do not have that ability to stretch and they begin to exhibit a different set of um, behaviors that we need to recognize and respond to. Not everyone is stretchy. And as we push some people who are not, to try to accommodate the needs of our workforce, we may be actually isolating people and beginning to compare them to each other. It's just a really fascinating piece of work that I'm finding and insightful, especially now. Let me turn that back to you folks. Happy to entertain questions or come for further conversation. Thanks so much, Annie, and thank you, Andrew. I think that um, there were some great takeaways from your both of your presentations. I, Andrew, I really um, think that the concept of being flexible um, is a bit of a pivot, especially from an HR standpoint, because um, as a sort of an HR lawyer, the, the advice I always give is be consistent, be consistent. And, and it is important, but it's important now to make a pivot and realize that everyone's dealing with different set of circumstances depending on their home situation. Annie, I love the idea of Chartspan's um, internal social media platform. I think that sounds great. It's a way, I think, to have people stay connected because so many times we hop on the Zoom meeting or the Microsoft Teams or whatever platform your company uses and immediately it's straight to business and so you don't have that chit chat that you might have at the beginning of other meetings. So I love that idea. 
and um, the employment lawyer in me um, says, I'm sure you have some good guidelines about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Um, so we have some time left. I have some questions, but Morgan, I'll ask you, do we have some questions from the participants that they'd like to have Annie or um, Andrew address? At this time, I don't see any come through, but we definitely would love to hear questions from our, our audience. So please put it in the chat because um, I know our panelists are eager to, to connect with you and answer any questions that you might have. So Jenny, take it away for the first few. Sure. Um, Andrew, I'd love to know, um, since it sounds like your experience was a bit more reactive um, at Alchemy than Chartspan. Chartspan was already in the process of going virtual. Are there any advantages that uh, Alchemy has seen with having more employees work remotely? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I'll tell you that there's not a long list that we would put out right now just because of the nature of, again, there's only so many people that we can send home because when you're running instruments and manufacturing equipment, you, you got to be there. Um, but we've, we've stretched and, and bent quite a bit and sent quite a few folks home. And um, that's really helped with retention and recruitment for some of those positions because a, a big pharma might have already done this a few years ago, right? To say like a project manager, for instance, um, why can't a project manager be in Wyoming and manage projects for alchemy that are in Europe, right? And, you know, they have uh, St. Louis as their main um, hub, and then they're managing projects in, you know, Australia and Japan and everywhere else. Why do they have to sit on site? Um, so that's helped us um, expand and, and really get some top talent during this challenging time um, where, you know, I've done FaceTime tours for people of our facilities that won't ever be in our facility just to, so they feel connected to it. You know, again, going to that connection piece because um, it's nice to know where you would have sat, but not having to relocate your whole family halfway across the country for a job that doesn't have to be on site now that we have really evaluated it and stretched. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say that's one of our advantages in, in some of our positions. We've probably been able to land some talent that we would not have been able to um, because of the pandemic and because of those factors of, for personal reasons of having to relocate. I think those are some great, great points. Um, I really, um, I agree with you on attracting talent that you may not otherwise have due to geographic restrictions sort of being lifted. Um, Morgan, I think I saw some questions come up. Do you want to pose those or should I read those? Take it away, Jenny. Okay. Um, all right, so for, um, for all the panelists, um, what have you found is the hardest aspect of going virtual and what tips do you have to ease that path for organizations? Um, I'll jump in quickly if I could. Um, I do want to comment though back to you, Andrew, that I think leading in a virtual or uh, leading virtual business now does, businesses now does open up talent for us, right? We don't have to be limited to those that are willing to and able to relocate. So absolutely hands down agree with you there. I think it, uh, I, I mentioned standing on the shoulders of my colleagues who did impressive and incredible work in a short period of time to distribute our teams. I think if I asked each of them that question, you might get a different answer. Two that were um, uh, prominent in my conversations with my colleagues, when I just asked them, help me frame this, help me talk about what we did, I think technology would say equipment and reliability of internet connections and speed, right? So by zip code, you have different levels of internet connectivity. A certain zip code, a community may be a DSL um, dependent, another building may have um, a fiber optic cable system. And so you're asking employees to be online and working um, in and on networks that they don't control. So the company doesn't control that ability to connect, right? So that's, that's hard in order uh, and, 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 and in a world where you're expecting predictability and work output and production, but not everybody has the same level of connectivity. And what do you do when systems go down, 
and you can't go to Starbucks to work, right? Like I used to do when I was traveling on and off airplanes, I could drop into Starbucks or a Panera and work for two hours. We can't do that anymore when our home systems fail us. So that's a challenge is how do you keep a network so to, in place to support your employees? How do you keep equipment readily available when there are equipment failures and your help desk isn't two floors down or, or a set of stairs down um, from you? I think our, our, our HR group that I have a tremendous respect for would say training in a virtual environment, given all that we have to make sure our employees understand and master because we're connecting directly with patients and virtual tools, um, that's hard. And um, leveraging a, a learning management system or LMS when you're doing it in, in a reactive way, because that was not in place. So all of those building blocks are still a work in progress and training to the level of competence and ensuring that your employees are ready to be market or client facing in a virtual world when you're still mastering virtual training is hard. So from the colleagues that I spoke with, I think those are the two preeminent things that they would say have been the hardest. And, and Andrew, of the, of the hardest, do you want to speak to what the hardest aspect was for um, alchemy and in any tips you have? Uh, you talked about kind of hindsight, I think, um, now having gone through this, tips to ease some of those challenges for some of the yeah. other organizations. Absolutely, and I, I will second everything that Annie just mentioned. Uh, I think those are great points and would apply to us as well. Um, kind of going back to our clarity, communication, and connection, I think one of our biggest challenges was just the, the culture that we had wasn't ready for this from a leadership perspective. And we had some hiccups and bumps along the way. And it really goes to the communication and connection piece uh, that we've discussed throughout. Um, communication is different now. It's not right or wrong, it's just different. And adjusting to be comfortable with that difference and setting those clear expectations with employees up front of this is how I prefer things to be now. Um, you have to diligently, purposefully do that now. And before, if you just saw somebody, it was easy to coach right away and um, check and adjust. And now it feels like, you know, if, if I'm going to coach an employee, I, I, I schedule a meeting and say, quick chat. And now, you know, is the, the employee's overly nervous about that, right? And, and it seems like a bigger deal than if I just caught you in the hallway real quick of, oh, can we do this a little different next time? Getting the employees and the supervision leadership um, comfortable with that difference. Um, and, and again, it goes to that connection. The more connection you have to somebody, the more trust that you have with that person, that they have your best interest at mind, no matter what. Um, so that makes those conversations go smoother. Um, that's the area that's been the most difficult is I don't think we all fully appreciated with all the challenges that we had um, setting up everybody for success when it came to training in that area. Uh, we would have, in hindsight, loved to have done much, much more training so that people were ready for those challenges versus tripping over a couple of those hurdles as we went um, and kind of you know, adjusting course as we went. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, there, we're, we're getting close. We've got about uh, seven minutes left in the session, and I, I see another great question that I'd love to hear from both of you all on, and that is, have you seen employee motivation and productivity change in a virtual environment? Would you like to go first, Annie? Uh, just a couple of stories. Again, I'm telling stories from my colleagues, but I'll tell um, two instead of one. One, um, I'll talk about our sales team, and then I'm going to talk about productivity and the, the clinical workforce that we have. Um, sales team was remote, as I mentioned, um, but our sales model um, required, and I mean required, that our sales executives request and organize a meeting with prospective clients early in the sales process. Our CEO and some of you who are familiar with Chartspan and, and um, have heard him speak for SC Bio in the past know that he is dogged about in-person in communication and connection um, being pivotal to building good partnerships and driving sales. Well, we couldn't schedule meetings anymore. 
And we went from a model that was built and predicated upon establishing a connection with physician leaders and administrative leaders of physician practices to you now have to create all of that magic over a video connection and you will never physically meet the prospective client during the sales during the sales process in person. We worried terribly about how that would hurt our ability to drive sales. And I can tell you we're performing at, if not better, we still have a lot of work to do in sales um, on our growth path, but we didn't find that we were losing deals because we couldn't meet in person. We were adapting to how to engage people in the value and the mission of what we do in a virtual environment. So I tip my hat to our salespeople who, and, and our client success leaders as well, because if you're in those roles, you gobble up energy from the people in the room that you meet with. It is your fuel. Um, and to take all of that and try to package it and can it and transmit it through a little bitty green dot on your laptop is just plain hard. And I think our folks have adapted and done well there. Um, in terms of um, productivity, um, I, I find our folks are productive in my in individual teams, and I don't worry about that as much because we are so connected all day long. Um, I heard an interesting story from one of our clinical leaders that um, because now we're trying to work flexibly across a day and they have a workload to deliver, but they can pace it themselves, clock in and clock out where they need to. There was a trend that the leader of our clinical operations team noted where people were clocking in earlier. Because if you could start earlier before your kids started school um, or, you, or you had a spouse at home that could be on deck, suddenly our clinical folks were clocking in instead of you know, 7.30, 7.45, 8 o'clock, folks are popping up at 6 o'clock. And do we know if there's real work for them to do at that hour of the day? And so how do we establish flexibility, allowing folks the freedom to move across their day, but yet set some boundaries around what the actual hours of our workday are? Because we can't have you front load the entire day because then you're no longer available for us at the end of the day. So again, some boundaries, but yet flexibility within the day. Yeah, and for you know purposes of of non exempt employees keeping tabs on people's hours, making sure those are being accurately recorded, and and trying to keep a control on overtime that's not approved is, has been a, an issue I've seen for some of my clients. I bet. Yeah. Andrew, what about you? Do you have you seen any challenges with productivity? Um, I, I'll keep my answer short because I know we're running low on time. I, I'll second everything that Annie said as well. I mean, that that was, it, it's funny how totally different companies will, will share lots of different challenges. Um, a little bit different note, though, um, the more collaborative the nature of the role was when they were here has been more challenging um, for those folks that are now, you know, required to work remote that again, it, it, when I survey them, most of them say, I'd prefer to be back on site. Um, the less collaborative nature of the role, um, more individual type of contributor role, um, the more successful that they are and able to do that because they're able to come in and out like Annie was talking about. Um, but when it's a role that you need to grab six people to solve a challenge all the time, um, it's hard to line up all six people real quick versus if you can look at them in the eyes and grab them around the facility, stick them in a conference room real quick, you can solve that challenge in 10 minutes. It takes two hours now, right, just to find that time to figure out when you can get everybody. Um, so that's been a challenge and that's an engagement challenge because that causes frustration and stress on people um, and, and we have to help solve that. So, you know, that's, that's an area where we're continuing to work. We, we don't have the silver bullet yet. Yeah, I think it's definitely important to be a bit, you have to be a bit more intentional, intentional about checking in with those that you're working with on projects to see where they are and to make sure people aren't falling behind. And um, whereas in the office, you might've just passed them by and been reminded or counted on, well, I sit next to Bob, I'll talk to him about it tomorrow. You have to really, schedule time to check in. Um, so we had one really good other question in, in 30 seconds or less. Do you all believe that re the remote work environment will return to pre-COVID levels once life returns to normal? Or do you foresee re remote work remaining a sizable part of work in the future? My answer is really short. 
it will not go back to the way that it was um, in my foreseeable future. Um, so. Yeah, and Jenny, I have to agree with that. When you know we vacate uh, real estate uh, of the size that we held, and we see that we're doing well in a virtual environment, it's really hard to make a case to take on that type of space again. Plus, you know, as Andrew commented, the ability to um, extend out your reach for talent is something that I don't think we'll ever go back on again. I tend to agree with both of you. Well, it looks like we're at the end of the, the time. I'm gonna turn this back over to Zach. Thank you so much, Annie, and thank you so much, Andrew. I've enjoyed talking with you. Thank you, it's been great. Right, thank you, Jenny. Uh, first, I wanna start and thank all the panelists again. Thank you, Andrew, thank you, Annie, thank you, Jenny. Incredible content, incredible insights. And thank you everyone that was able to join us. We dropped their um, LinkedIn profiles in the chat.